Hello everyone. I am very grateful that I can stand here today in Leiden in the space where Kleifinga gave his lecture 80 years ago. It is a bit strange that I'm not in Israel um, as was the plan at first, but in a way serendip serendipity has it that I'm now standing here in the very same spot where he gave his very important, especially for Israel, uh, lecture 80 years ago. Then this space was full of people. Then um, there was a different uh, crisis um, happening. Today I'm standing here also because of COVID-19 restrictions in an empty space, addressing you through new technologies, namely through the internet and the Zoom meeting we will have today. Today there is another resonance between what Kleverga said then and what I will talk about today. And that is that we are living in a time of crisis. It may be a different time of crisis, but as you will see in my lecture, there are certain parallels and similarities between what's happening now and what happened then. Today I'm going to talk about play in times of confinement. First, let me stress the importance of play. One of the main persons who inspired this talk is uh, Johan Huizinga. And Johan Huizinga, as some of you may know, is, has been very important for the University of Leiden, but was also a very close friend of Kleveringa. He already wrote in 1938, and that's why he's so important for how we can think about play and the importance of play, that culture arises and unfolds in and as play. So humans, and not only children, need to play to produce and sustain culture. This thought is central to my talk today. Because what Huizinga did is also identifying a very strong link between freedom and play. Yet, in times of confinement, so when you are not that free, people haven't stopped playing at all, as we see in history as well. We seem to be, as humans, always capable of finding play elsewhere. In the times of COVID-19, in our kitchens, at our tables, in our backyards, and also in our heads. The question then is, is what we are witnessing now during the crisis uh, of COVID-19 specific for COVID-19 or is there something to learn from this which you can also uh, see in a sort of bigger scope? I would say yes. Play can be a very important means to stay mentally and physically sound in times of crisis and more specifically for this lecture in situations voluntary or involuntary confinement. Let me first show you the structure of this lecture. First, I will talk about freedom and play. I will talk about the tension between freedom of play and also how we tend to demarcate play, to have it in specific places. I will also talk about the difference in that respect between curated play and illicit or forbidden play and forbidden playgrounds. Then I will talk about play during extreme involuntary or voluntary confinement and how we look for safe and unsafe spaces during times of confinement. Play and freedom. In 1959, an important declaration was written for children specifically, the rights of the child. And in that statement, it says that the child shall have opportunity for play and recreation which should be directed to the same purpose as education, society and the public authorities shall endeavour to promote the enjoyment of this right. Now, this statement, this UNESCO statement, is only about children, but surely um, it, you can sort of widen it and say that we have the right to play. It's important to our well-being to be able to play. Also for Housinga, play is freedom, he wrote. As soon, and you can all um, recognize that maybe from your childhood as, as well, if someone forces you to play, it's not playful anymore. So there's a very strong correlation between play and freedom. 
On the other hand, as I already said in one of my first slides, there's also a tension between on the one hand freedom and on the other hand how play is curated, how it takes place in a playground for example, or on a game board, right? There is this tension that you need that demarc demarcation almost to feel that freedom. Here are some examples. You see a playground in Amsterdam. Um, you see a skateboard uh, park in Amsterdam. You also see a Japanese uh, game uh, space in which you have to enter first uh, in order to start to play. So there's a sort of change, this sort of threshold you have to step over a demarcation to start playing. Similarly, when you play a computer game, there's always the start of the, comp the, the game. It's not like you're suddenly there. So there is this sort of dem dem demarcation which you need to enter that playful space. This has to do with another concept of Housinga, which is often debated as well, which is called the magic circle, or in Dutch, in uh, untranslated, the tovercirkel. For Huizinga, the magic circle was a sort of very important principle to understand play. So on the one hand, he says that play has to be voluntary and is about, you have to have the freedom to play. And on the other hand, he says, but it takes place in a separate space. This idea of the magic circle that Huizinga introduced has to do also with the time he lived in. Namely, in the 19th century, especially the end of the 19th century, you see a change in which play becomes far more curated. It becomes part of a surveillance policy, you could say. You send your child to the playground, which is sort of framed in such a way that you can see what your child is doing. So, curated playgrounds are regulated and are, in that way, you could say, offer you less uh, freedom because they are about order, so that order you have to adhere to. But within that framework, there are, of course, always possibility of free play. And it's very interesting, if you look at all the playgrounds, that risk is far more higher, actually, than in playgrounds now, where, you know, the heights and, and are, are, are less high and the ground is softer, so there's less risk of falling and injuring yourself, for example. But those curated playgrounds uh, are very um, uh, much culturally dependent. They are imbued with certain ide ideology and it would be very interesting to do a study about, say, how playgrounds in the former Soviet Union uh, compare with those in Israel, for example, because I'm sure within that, if you look at the architecture of that uh, playground, you can learn a lot about the ideologies which are at stake here. So, in those demarcated spaces, there are all these ideas um, instilled in what play is, but also what play shouldn't be or isn't. It shouldn't be too dangerous, for example. As I wrote with my colleague uh, Larissa Jort uh, in a forthcoming article, that curated playgrounds are not just there, they're always the outcomes of processes informed by particular ideologies, resonating with the ideal of modern disciplinary societies. And we refer her to Foucault, who very much did a lot of work on how societies nowadays and since the 19th century became disciplinary and ordered and that you could see what was happening, the idea of surveillance. In these modern disciplinary societies, control, hence, is pivotal. Additionally, these playgrounds also subscribe to prevalent ideas of childhood as a separate stage of life. In other words, we still think, and that's actually not true at all, that play is something only for children. They're also imbued with educational ideologies. Um, what is good to play with? Where do you learn from, for example? And ideas about leisure, as part of a mechanized industrial society. When we take a leap and we go to the post-war playgrounds, so 20th century instead of 19th century playgrounds, um, the idea of control is even taken a step further, I would say. We, Wright, Jort and I, 
that actually it brings in architecture and urban planning um, into the equation and tightens protocols regarding safety and risk. So in a way you could say that post-war playgrounds are often less free. That's my point here. Yet, we all remember those moments of play when we were young especially. And for me at least, the most important moments I remember were not in those sort of curated playgrounds, but outside of them. We always look for that freedom, right, to play somewhere. And the most strong memories we have is about that illicit uh, play. I, for example, remember that I was, um, you know, making fires where I was not allowed to make them. And I came back home and my mother said, I smell smoke on you, what did you do? And we said, nothing, nothing. That was so exciting. That was so intensely playful, I would say. So there is a correlation between risk, the forbidden and play here. Also, I put a, on this slide a picture of a quarantine rave from recent, uh, from this summer, I think in the UK. This is again an example. People are isolated and what do they do? They are, it's very regulated where you can play and how people look for the forbidden territory to still play. As also we write in an article about outside the playground, play can unfold. That is more uneven, also regarding the senses, messy and tricky, and appeals to our senses in more imaginative and visceral ways as well. You can fall. You can hurt yourself. Here are two pictures, one of Parkour's, one of a post-war playground uh, in bombed, I think, London, but anyway in the UK, uh, which was also propagated at that time that children should play in ruins instead of uh, sort of clear areas. And that was also taken up uh, later in Europe, and I'm sure not only in Europe, in the hippie movement where you know, they started to make playgrounds which were more dangerous, where you could build huts, for example. Um, so there was, there's always this tension between where you find freedom in play. Unregulated or illicit playgrounds, of course, illicit is a bit more extreme than unregulated, are non-delineated. -deline they can shift their borders the whole time. Where I made my fire, I could make it somewhere else the next time, right? So there are makeshift and they come up in unexpected places, like the rave, for example. And in a way, what, the play, what makes the play more deep, maybe, deep play, which is a word also used uh, by Geertz, the anthropologist, is that you look for a crisis. You look for that moment that it's almost going wrong. You look for unsafe play spaces. That's what's happening a lot during crisis as well whether you are um, uh, confronted with unsafe spaces and you can't help it, or you look for them actively, it is about finding that deeper play in times of crisis. Another interesting example, which I couldn't, um, couldn't uh, leave out of my talk actually, is the case of Chernobyl, where a uh, crisis hit so hard that nobody can live there hardly anymore. I think nowadays some people are living there again. And where people go as tourists to watch and look at the sort of ruin, to look at the crisis and to find a sort of playful um, curiosity in visiting places like that, including the playground which uh, this picture depicts. Another example of illicit play is the movement of urban exploration in which people go into cities and go actually actively try to find places where you can't easily get into and make that into a playful exercise of exploring the city underground and also above the ground. And here's a book about that, uh, Explore Everything, Place Hacking in the City. Of course, hacking is a kind of playful exercise as well. So, to conclude for this part of my lecture, there is a tension between freedom of play and curating play, we can say, maybe even a paradox, you could say, and materiality of play matters, you know? It does matter what you touch and what the possibilities are.
uh, the affordances are of the materials around you, which are maybe less free in a curated playground than a, a makeshift playground. And also, and I want to stress this, that play and how it brings freedom is also a highly personal thing. It's totally different from someone else than it is, for example, for me. And it's complex, it depends where you live, what your relations are, what your religion is as well, and how you deal with your religion, because certain religions have more or less space for play as well. And it's situated, it's always taking place at a particular moment, in a, at a particular time. This brings me to the second part of my lecture, in which I will uh, focus more on extreme confinement, which can be either voluntary or involuntary. So here we go more into the crisis situation, which is happening also at this very moment in time. When we talk about play in those crisis moments, it can be really be a way to look for safe spaces, right? A safe space in your head, for example. Examples of that, which, will, uh, which I will briefly touch upon in this part of my talk, are of course the COVID-19 crisis itself, but also being imprisoned, um, being isolated and also being at war. Let me first go to COVID-19. As you see on one of these pictures, many depended very much uh, per country, but in some countries you couldn't go outside hardly at all, so all playgrounds were literally shut, closed down. In the Netherlands, for example, that was a bit more mild, as they say we had an intelligent lockdown. Um, but anyway, whether it's mild or more extreme, we had less uh, uh, possibilities to play also, to go to the gym, for example, or to go to the theatre, etc. And what we saw, that at that moment, that the outside space shrunk, so to speak, people started to play at home more. They either started to make Pokemon Go into a Pokemon Stay practice, um, having their home as their playground, but they also, for example, um, started to play more card games. And one of them, Solitaire, already says it all right, you do that in isolation. Also, uh, there was a big surge in uh, people buying games, either digital or non-digital games, one of which was a great success was Animal Crossing. And it comes as no surprise that in Animal Crossing, actually what you do is visiting your neighbours, tending your plot and moving around in an open space outside. So when the real outside space shrinks, we find ways to find spaces in a different way to play. So, what this shows, and this crisis, this COVID-19 crisis shows, is that we have always a quest for and a need to play, and we need to play also to keep sane, to keep healthy. It's very important for our well-being during times of confinement. And it also, sh I think, shows, or it is an example, of that it, this is not a unique thing to this crisis, but a recurring situation when being confined and actually many stories of prisoners and refugees uh, attest to this. For example, in books this has been discussed a lot. And one important book also in relation to the Second World War is Schachnovelle from, of uh, Stefan Zweig, in which he uses the floor of the, of the space in which he is imprisoned as a gigantic chessboard. Another example is an evil cradling by Brian Keenan, uh, an Irish uh, person who was taken hostage and tried to uh, make space in his head to play. He did that first and foremost by um, imagining building a house in his head. And when he was free again, he actually also built the house he thought of in his head in reality. He also did it by cracking a lot of jokes and being almost on the, on the verge of insanity, you could say, but by making these jokes and always stepping a bit outside of himself, he kept his sanity. 
So this sort of um, risky, playful behavior can be very, very important to keep healthy and keep uh, human during extreme times of confinement. Another uh, interesting example, and there are many, many examples of this actually, is what uh, soldiers do um, during uh, war situations. Because what we often forget is that during war, one has to wait a lot. One is confined a lot, like in the trenches, as the two uh, photographs here show. One of uh, soldiers playing card games, and the other one of the truce, uh, which is sometimes debated whether that happened or not, between the Germans and the, the English, I, I believe, during the First World War, in which they played football during Christmas. There apparently are also archaeological digs, and I tried to find a photograph of that but um, through my colleague uh, at the archaeology department, but I didn't succeed. But apparently, when they do digs, archaeological digs on a Roman battlefield, they often find uh, artefacts toys, things which were clearly meant to play with. And that is because, and I find that very interesting, we sometimes forget that crisis is not only about drama, but it is about a lot of waiting and a lot of boredom as well, a lot of killing time. Also, as many of you may know, there's a whole collection in the Yad Vashem Museum collection of chess boards, uh, makeshift, made improvised ones. I, I have two here on this slide. One which is literally from a concentration camp in which people made a chessboard from bits and pieces they found. And the other one is made from pe people who were on their way in Cyprus to Israel and made these chess games to keep each other occupied. But also the occupation of making that is of course already play, making a chessboard. There are many, many examples of this, this and many chess examples as well, in particular. So, both these slides have to do, in a way, with waiting. Uh, the first case, waiting for something uh, very unknown, you could say. Um, and the second one, waiting to come, come to Israel, right? Waiting to make that last move. Ludic waiting is very important, I think. Uh, the waiting in prison, the waiting for things to get over, to change, to get better, for me to be able to get, go to Israel again. That ludic waiting is an important um, activity, strangely enough. Waiting seems to be very passive, but it is an activity in a way. So the question actually is, what happens with play when one has to pass time, when one has to kill time? One starts to reminisce, one starts to fantasize, one starts to reflect as well. Like my example of Brian Keenan, who reflects on his own jokes to keep sane. So these, although they are very boring moments, they may look at, like boring moments, they're also very rich moments full of possibilities. Together with uh, Stephanie de Smaler, I wrote uh, an article about playing and waiting, in which we actually talk about a computer game, Civilization, and we sort of focus also on how, uh, what happens when we have to wait for our turn, or wait because the computer uh, program breaks down at that moment. And what we found is that these moments of waiting were actually very much part of being in play and that our thoughts were not, precisely because our thoughts were not about strategies to progress the game or to win, we started to think about what our decisions meant. So this is a very small example, not from a crisis situation, literally, which shows what happens at the moment that one has to wait. What happens at these moments, these breaks, these pauses, these long waits sometimes when one is imprisoned, is that it has very negative sides, surely, but it also uh, gives us certain possibilities. It makes visible to us, maybe, other configurations of life. And it also is a moment which yeah, presents us with possibilities to unravel a uh, habit and to go into different ways of thinking, like uh, Brian Keenan thinking about building that house in a way that was a way also to think about changing his habit 
and building his own, own house, which he had never thought of and did before. This brings me to an important, um, and in my uh, talk actually discussed or critiqued, I would say, um, uh, psychologist of play, you could call him, Cheek sent me highly, um, which actually is quite contradictory to what I just said now. Because for him, and uh, play is actually the optimal experience of flow that only stops when boredom and anxiety kicks in. Emphasizing boredom and anxiety because what happens in times of confinement is exactly the latter, boredom and anxiety can kick in. So I would say that in times of confinement, boredom and anxiety are always at least imminently present. And that poses the question or prompts the question, um, is it then that play at such moments of crisis is a tactic to counter boredom and fear? Or is it also a way to transform uh, that boredom and fear into something else, which maybe also still includes a kind of boredom. The repetition of movements, for example, it has some, something boring to it, but it can also be playful. It often is a thing in play that you repeat the movement. So, Cheek sent me highly and his colleague Bennett make this very strong definition of what play is. And this definition has been very important for game designers as well. It says play is flow, basically. So play may stretch over longer or shorter periods of time, but it is not characterized by boredom or anxiety. And now I wonder with you, probably, is that so? Is that play during confinement a way to keep boredom and anxiety at bay, at bay? Or is it a way to incorporate boredom and anxiety in your um, being, in your practice, in the situation you are in? Because in times of confinement, things are slightly different as in normal lives, as many of you probably know very well. Because boredom and fear are always imminently present when you are confined. And the question then is whether that transforms a boredom into something else, as I just said already. Let me turn to a bit of philosophy here. And that is Walter Benjamin, a German Jewish philosopher who also sadly uh, died um, at the beginning of the Second World War. And he has interesting ideas about boredom because he actually sees boredom as very important to our well-being and our creativity. So it's not outside of play, but actually inside play for him. He said famously that boredom is the dream bird that hatches the, eggs, the egg of experience. So actually through boredom, which you are very much confronted with in, in times of confinement, you actually experience, you become more wise in a way. Without boredom, the gift for listening is lost and the community of listeners disappears. This again connects to this idea that we reflect during boredom and that reflection is also, can be a kind of play. So according to, if we take Walter Benjamin's uh, statements further, boredom can be part of playful or creative processes. So I would say play is crucial for survival and well-being in crisis situations, such as imprisonments and other states of isolation. And in this talk, I have been talking about how we find freedom in confinement through play. I have mainly focused on this crisis, but have made some connections with other crises and other moments of confinement. I hope we can discuss this later tonight in more detail, but I thank you for now for your attention. <laughs>